Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I'm finally reviewing Unk. And I say finally only because I took my time with this one. I got my plays in, I waited around, this didn't have any uh, Kickstarter date that I needed to meet or anything like that, and I wanted to get in several plays because from my very first play, I thought this was well a rival for Blood Rage. You see, Rising Sun, that's not true, Ankh, already I messed up, wow, Ankh from Command is part of the trilogy of Blood Rage, Rising Sun, and now Ankh, a trilogy of three area control games from Command, from Eric Lang, miniatures by Studio McVeigh, art by Adrian Harvey, and Adrian Harvey, I think that's correct, am I doing that right? Adrian Smith, Adrian Smith, I don't know what I'm doing in this video. In any case, part of this trilogy, Ankh is the third in the trilogy, and Rising Sun was a game that I backed and was excited for and played it and thought it was good and then kept it for a few years and tried it again and eventually just got rid of it because it wasn't Blood Rage for me. And it's not meant to be Blood Rage, it's just a different game. You can check out my video on Blood Rage vs. Rising Sun on the channel if you want to see that. This is Ankh. And like I said at the beginning, for my very first play, this was well a rival for Blood Rage. This is this, the very first play, we all sat there, and there's at least one person in my game group who already likes this more than Blood Rage. I am not yet that person, although this is a review of the base game only, not any of the expansion content. We're using some gods, we've used gods and guardians, but I haven't used the main expansion in terms of mixing up the gameplay. And I think that's enough of a general tangent all over the place to get into the general overview. Ankh is an area control game from Eric Lang, from Come On. It's an area control game where the goal is to end up with as much points as you can by the end of the game, but there's a lot of interesting things going on here that differentiate it from various area control games. For one thing, the concept of the merge mechanic, this idea that as you go through the game, you're going to be moving up this track, and when you hit a certain point, when you trigger a certain battle, you will have the two weakest gods in the game will merge together, working as one combined force. And that, from the very first time it was ever announced, that was a controversial aspect of the game that to this day remains a controversial aspect Aspect, but we will dive into it in terms of the opinion and all that. It also has the potential for player elimination. I say potential because it has not yet happened in any of our games. You see, when you get to the final second, the second to last battle in this game, you're going to have the players who are all in the red eliminated from the game, and then you'll play for a little longer, and whoever wins, wins. We've always won before that happens, so we have not yet had player elimination in any of our games, but it is possible for this game to have that. As far as the general sequencing, the general sequence is every single round you're going to take one or two actions. You're going to grab these action tracks which involve summoning figures, it involves gaining followers which are like main resources of the game to, to get a lot of other things going, it involves unlocking Ankh powers, you're going to have different Ankh powers on the bottom of your board, and then it has moving your figures around the board. So you're going to take two actions every single round from that track, moving these little figures. So let's say I go ahead and I summon the figures, I'm going to summon figures, and let's say I go ahead and unlock a power on this track. I move those tokens up. Rinse and repeat, going round and round clockwise from the players. The problem is, as you hit through the end of one of these tracks, if a player chooses, they can go ahead, and for the first action, they can go ahead and move figures around the board, and then they can move this over here, which will trigger the movement of this along the track. So as you hit those little end points, this will reset to the player count, depending on the player count of the game, and then you're going to be moving this along the tracks over here in order to get various things. Those things will involve taking control of various buildings, they'll involve putting out new camels on the board, creating new regions on the board. You see, there's a bunch of different scenarios in the game, each scenario comes with its own pre-starting map setup for different player counts, but then as the game continues, as you hit those camel regions, you'll be putting new camels on the board, and that will unlock and create new regions, thus uh, creating new areas to control in this area control game. But then additionally, and most importantly I would say, as you move along this track you'll trigger battles. Each of these red spots over here triggers a battle, which the, those battles, that's going to be five, maximum five battles in the entire game, although five battles is more specifically five battle rounds. You see every single time you trigger a battle, starting from region one and working your way upwards, you're going to compare your strength in those regions, you're going to play cards, every player is going to go ahead and look at their hand of cards, pick a card to play into that battle, and then they'll all reveal it and you'll execute whatever is on that card. And this have very much has a Blood Rage or Kemet style approach to the combat of you have a set number of cards, and unlike Blood Rage, more like Kemet I guess, you have a set specific hand of cards, everyone knows what's there, everyone knows to a certain extent what's discarded, and then you're trying to play little mind games of what the best card is for you. You see, if I play Plague, that would be great, but you might play that you get points for every character who's killed, so maybe you'll do this and I'll do that. It has that little mind game aspect, a mind game aspect that's prevalent in Rising Sun, in Blood Rage, in Kemet, which is not part of the trilogy, but does have a similar feel to a degree. And so you'll be playing those cards, going through the battle, resolving them, and you'll go through a little bit of a sequence of gaining points for winning battles, gaining points depending on the cards you played, you'll be gaining points for the various control over the three different monument types, these obelisk pyramids and temples in the game, you'll get points for whoever controls the most in that region. 
all in an effort to slowly move up the devotion track, those are the points of the game, while trying to win the battles, while, to, while trying to take out your opponents who will ultimately lose, lose their figures, lose their presence, lose their area control in the game. The main game mechanic come down to the actions around there, monitoring the track over here, trying to unlock your bonuses. You're going to have your Ankh powers. Every god in the game has their own individual Ankh power, their own individual power that will change how that god plays and interacts with the board. And they'll have a, a similar, every character will have the same exact sequence of Ankh powers that they can unlock in the game. By taking that lowest track over there, unlock Ankh power. You spend some of your followers and you unlock a power, giving you ways to earn followers, giving you upgrades to your buildings, and giving you in the final column ways to earn further devotion in the game. The main goal of the game is to end the game with the most devotion, but you have to be mindful of the other players along the way. You have to be mindful of how to move around the board. You see, every single time you take a move action, you're going to move every single one of your figures three spots around the board, allowing for drastic repositioning of your figures, drastic repositioning of the board. And this game, everything in the game of Ankh comes down to the timing. You have to understand when and where battles will be triggered. You have to understand when and where people are going to be taking those actions, earning those extra bonuses. You have to be setting yourself up for success, even as you're mindful of the fact that every other player is trying to do the same thing. But you move around the board, you unlock followers, you summon new figures, all while being mindful of the various rules around how the monuments work, how you gain followers, where you can summon figures, all of that, repositioning your characters, repositioning your gods, your gods can't be killed, repositioning your guardians, guardians, there's going to be different guardians for every single game, you'll have three guardians, level one, level two, and a level three guardian that are present in every single game, each one giving you a small little monster to try to summon and control as you unlock your Ankh powers, and those monsters are going to give you some new ability, whatever those abilities might be, different ways to break the game, different ways for your opponents to be on their toes as you go through Ankh. Rinse and repeat until you get to the third battle. Once you get to the third battle, once you've moved far long enough along that track, at the end of the third battle, you're, gonna, you're going to merge the two lowest gods. Whoever's is lowest in the ocean track, they will merge all their characters together. There's a little rule set I won't heavily go into a, in terms of what survives, what doesn't. But effectively, they start acting as one conjoined god. You'll take this little thing over here, you'll put the gods on it, you'll put the base of the other one, indicating that they're acting as a single merged god. You'll take your little extra card, put it on their side, and then now, for the rest of the game, Whenever it's your turn, you take a single action going around the board. The other players still take their two actions. You take a single action. You have the combined powers of both of your gods, so you have a little bit of an edge there. More importantly, especially depending on the player seating, you may end up with a sequencing ability, especially if you have like you know two players merging across the table with one another. Then you have players going, power, players going, power, rat, rat, back and forth around the board, giving you an edge to the way you operate, to the chances of you winning, because previously the two of you were in last place, and now to working together, you may yet win the game. Rinse and repeat until you get to the fourth battle. At the end of the fourth battle, any players that are still in the red area of the devotion track are immediately eliminated. Now, like I said, we've never had that happen because the game ends either at the end of the fifth battle or alternatively, when, when any player gets to the very top of the devotion track, that will trigger end game, which means we've never had players actually be eliminated at the end of the fourth battle because we've always had our games end doing battle four as you hand out the devotion from the fourth battle, from the fourth round of battles, you've had someone else win, and thus we've never had player elimination in the game. That's a general overview. You go around and around, taking one or two actions a turn, one or two because if you trigger one of these first, then you don't get to take a second action. You go around and around, triggering one or two actions a turn, you resolve any movement of this, resolving any abilities, you create new regions, take control of new places, you play cards and battles, try to win the battles, put new figures on the board, unlock powers, take advantage of your god's unique power, rinse and repeat until the game is over and someone has won the game, and that is Ankh. That's, that's the, the, the way you play this game. Which brings us to the review part, starting with uh, preferences and biases, things like that. A and to begin with, this is an area control game. I like area control for better and for worse. It means that I'm always holding games to the higher standard of the best area control games, but I do like the genre of area control. It's one of my favorite genres, at least when the things surrounding it give me enough reason to dive into it. Secondly, this is a command game, and I, I tend to like Kaman as a company, not necessarily their games in and of themselves, but I do like the production value and miniatures that go into their games, and it absolutely does bias me towards those games. I will look to justify keeping and liking games that have production quality that look like this on my table. Because getting rid of games that look like this always makes me a bit sad, so I'm always slightly incentivized to say how much I like it. But that's as far as general preferences and biases, although that leads straight into art and components. 
art and components, I mean, in general, the art of the game is solid. I won't really talk about the, I'm knocking things over, I apologize. I won't really talk about the board art so much. It does the job, it's clean, it's functional. It's not, doesn't shine in any particular way, but it is very clean and it is very functional and I appreciate and enjoy it. But the miniatures, the miniatures are off the charts. These are absolutely amazing. In terms of the Rising Sun Blood Rage uh, trilogy, in terms of that general trilogy, I would say that Anki does have my favorite miniatures from the trilogy, although I like the M biased by the Egyptian theme. I tend to appreciate and enjoy the Egyptian theme very very much so overall between the general miniature quality production between the theme between the various upgrades they have i would say the r10 components are absolutely amazing in this game we have upgraded tokens we have these little shiny deluxe fight tokens granted it's worth noting i very much do have kickstarter copy like a kickstarter copy here with all of the dual layer floor dual layer player boards the heavier card stock the upgraded tokens the upgraded pyramids so if you're looking and buying a retail copy understand that what you see in front of you it will have these amazing miniatures but lots of the other stuff here will not be in that copy but in general in terms of the kickstarter copy art and components are off the charts as far as theme and narrative like i said already i like the theme i like egyptian theme games i don't have a ton of my collection i have kemet i have ankh but i may probably have others i'd have to take a look at my shelves but i do like the egyptian theme i don't yet think it's overused or overdone i like it over here as far as narrative there's there's no narrative past the fact that you have gods fighting over places and stuff there's no not much of a narrative as far as the game goes as far as ease of play, the rules are actually very, very easy. I want to say that this is the simplest rule set that I've seen from the, the trilogy of Ankh, uh, of Blood Rage, Rising Sun, and Ankh. Uh, but in general, even if you're not comparing it to those three games, I would say that this rule set is very easy to pick up. It's fairly short. It's very clear. I had no real questions. This was a very easy game to dive into, a fairly easy game to teach. The table size is what you'd expect from an area control game. It's going to be a little on the large side. What you see here on this, like, you know, top, ca top camera and all that, you're seeing the the main board, the other side boards, and one character. Understand that the more characters you have in the game, which you're going to have more than one, I'm just showing you one for the sake of getting it all on camera, but you will have to have your other characters on board, so it's going to take more table space than what you're seeing over here. It's not a ton of table space, but it's certainly not on the small end. As far as game time as well, this comes in, it, I'm going to say it varies. We've had games of Ankh that have come in in the 90 minute mark, which is great. That is very accessible, very short, and the amount of punchiness it gives you for those 90 minutes is absolutely excellent. At the same time, we've also had games that came in at the three-hour mark, although I should say game. We've had a game that came in at the three-hour mark. So it does definitely have a range depending on how much time the players are taking, depending on the amount of AP analysis paralysis going on at the table. But overall, I would say that ignoring exceptions... Ankh is fairly reasonable as far as the playtime for the game it gives you for the area control genre experience it gives you. Generally, it comes in at around 90 minutes to 2 hours. All that pretty easy and accessible to jump into, dive into, all of that. As far as player count, this is a 2 to 5 player game. I have played it at 2, 3, and 4 players. I have not played it at 5. 2 players, in my opinion, does work well. And I will say in general that, that for me, well, let's do, let's do one player count at a time. Two players works well, in my opinion. I know that I've seen people who think that it's an amazing two-player game. It's good. It works well. I would not play Rising Sun or Blood Rage at two players. I would happily play Ankh at two players. That said, two players is my least favorite experience from the two to four player games I've played. Like I said, I have not played it at five. I, I think five would be a bit cluttered. I'd rather play something like Kemet or Socrates at five. But at five, I imagine would work. But I'm just I'm extrapolating out from four players. As far as three and four players, personally speaking, I like three and four players both equally. That said, if you look at Board Game Geek, I highly recommend this as a resource in general. If you look at the Board Game Geek preferred player counts, for most people, three players heavily gets dinged. And the reason for that is likely going to be the merge mechanic. And because in a three player game, you're going to have the two lowest players merge, and then they're fighting against a single stronger player, which gives you more room for them to potentially overwhelm and have that catch up mechanic, which can be a frustrating experience. That's, I'm just presuming why three players has been dinged on board game geek for myself three and four players were both solid experiences although part of that will be biased by the fact that we've never had a merged player win the game that's been our experience so far we've never had that happen and so while i do have frustrations about the merge mechanic that i will get to I haven't had that issue with three versus four players. I would say three and four, I've enjoyed both. Three gives you a slightly shorter experience, a little bit less, a little bit more happening on your turns, a little bit less going on waiting for others, but four gives you that higher level of interaction. I like three and four players both equally, but again, I'm noting that I think that I'm a little bit the exception there, and that 
general ratings seem to give three players a little worse in terms of just judging for your own player count. Uh, Board Game Week, I believe, ranks two and four players as the best player counts for this game. As far as what I, oh, and as far as interaction, interaction is huge. Sorry for that. Interaction is absolutely huge in this game. Tons of interaction in the game. It's an area control game. That's what you'd expect in, well, an area control game. As far as the review part, I mean, this is all dabbling in review, but as far as what I like and all of that, starting off the bat, powers and abilities are present left, right, and center. Every single god has their own ability, and while I theoretically want more diversification from the gods, this is really branching into what I what I want more of as opposed to whatever, but each god comes with their own game-breaking ability, and I say game-breaking because you will frequently look at the other players at the table and question why their power is so much better than yours, meanwhile they're often doing the same to you. Every single power is hugely influential. I cannot say whether they're all balanced. I, I've, I've only played every single god that I, I can rotating my god, so I've only played with each one once, and I haven't played with all the powers yet. But in general, the powers seem to fairly be fairly balanced. There's one that we think is slightly potentially overbalanced, over overpowerful, overpowered, or whatnot. But again, we haven't played with it enough to to comprehensively say whether it is or isn't balanced. What I would say is overall, it seems to be pretty balanced. The powers, tons of powers and abilities. You have your general Ankh power track over here where there's multiple ways to level up and grow your powers all of them providing a fun way to try to choose which which branching path you want to take which buildings you want to level up which way to earn points or which way to earn followers in the game i like all of that and then there's the guardians there's a giant stack of guardians again note i have the kickstarter copy with all the extras but giant stack of cards just different guardians every game will have three guardians in the game so you're always gonna have a ton of variability from these but there's a lot of powers and abilities a lot of ways to mix up the experience lots of guardians that will break the game in different ways not really break the game but adjust the way you experience the game in different ways and the zones and scenarios give you a ton more variability this is a game that is chock full of variability between between the variable guardians, between the numerous gods you'll have, between the scenarios and the different ways you can set up and change the board mid-game. And some of the scenarios give you different ways to experience the game in terms of rules as well, not just initial map setup, but also rules changes to the game. So there's a lot of different ways to go through Ankh. And the action sequencing is a lot of fun. That idea of the choosing two actions, you have to choose two different actions, you have to go through it in a specific order. So you have to take first, you have to go down the track. I can't summon figures and then move. I could move and then summon figures. And that order is important as you go through the actions and choosing which actions you take and then choosing sometimes to give up your second action in order to take a single powerful action that will give you control over the way this ability track moves out or perhaps the token in battle and let you resolve that. There's a lot of room for manipulating that action track and going for the sequencing you want trying to choose when and where to escalate the game. There's a lot of agency that that track gives you and a lot of push and pull. A lot of decisions around what you want versus what you're about to set the next player up for. And then the merge mechanic. I like the merge mechanic. I'm not going to pretend I don't. I I overall enjoy the merge mechanic. I have complaints, and I'll get to them in the what I don't like section, but I think the merge mechanic, it really keeps, it works as a beautiful caster mechanic, in my opinion, in the sense that it takes players who are otherwise not currently competitive, it combines them together, and it makes them more of a threat. Every single game I've played of Ankh so far has resulted in two players who were not a threat merging together and then becoming a threat, and then not winning either. To me, that is the epitome of how, a, of how a catcher mechanic should work. It should keep people in the game, but it shouldn't make them win. When you have a catcher mechanic that takes the weaker players and it makes them win, that just basically means it incentivizes losing in order so that you win, which is a messed up game state, and I don't like that. But every single game that we've had of Ankh has resulted in players becoming a threat, becoming a tactical threat that the winning players have to take a look and say, they're working together, they're doing their thing, and we have to be careful or they'll win. So it's kept people in the game, which is what a catcher mechanic should do. It has kept all the players invested. It has kept all the players competitive. And I'm okay with the fact that at some point in the future, the merged players will win a game. I'm okay with that. At some point, it has to happen, because otherwise they're not really a threat. But for the most part, it has kept everyone competitive without giving the blast players an actual win, thus acting exactly how I like a catcher mechanic to work. So um, I, and I'm, this is going to be something that's wildly different based on your experience. But I will say that I'm fully aware of the fact that you could play this game without the merge mechanic at all, and it wouldn't change the experience. I mean, it would change the experience, but it wouldn't break the game. The game would still work. And I was fully prepared to do that. If the merge mechanic was something that did not work for us, I would have absolutely house ruled it goodbye, and that's fine. There's even a scenario that doesn't use the merge mechanic. But that hasn't been an issue for us, and for us, every single game, I will use the merge mechanic. 
As far as nitpicks, what I can see others a lot liking, basically the variety of complaints that don't overall negatively affect my experience, but are worth talking about. First of all, there is that potential concern around power balance and whatnot. I don't know whether one god is more powered or powerful than another. We haven't played any individual god enough times or in any combination or with specific guardian abilities for us to be able to say comprehensively. There are definitely times where combinations seem powerful, but it takes more than one play of a single combo for me to talk about it. So there's definitely the concern of that. But I would, what I will say that might be a concern for you as far as the way you approach any of these games is Ankh, more so than Blood Rage, more so than Rising Sun, more so than a lot of area controlled game, to a certain extent feels a lot more like a numbers experience. The area control is a bit more abstracted. It feels a little crunchier in a, in a way that's great. I think that if you have that Euro side of you that enjoys Euros, I think this is a very solid game. But if you're looking for pure rage, pure, pure power, pure thematic clashing, it feels a bit more like a numbers game than other, other games in this genre. Now, for me, that's not a problem. I enjoy numbers game area controls. We'll talk about that at the end when we get to game recommendations and all that. But it's certainly worth noting as far as yourself, I think it feels a drop more abstracted than some other area controls. And then the merge aspect, this is going to be where I, I'm going to complain or nitpick around the merge mechanic. While I overall like the merge mechanic, the other thing that has consistently happened with it is the person who's higher, because you have the players in the two last place who merge. You have this player and that player both merging. Every single time we've seen the merge, this player becomes the dominant player who is more a threat and more involved in the game. And this player often feels like second fiddle and is in the game giving advice but not being as active as in terms of making the choices of the merge player. Meaning the merge mechanic works, it does the job, but it kind of ends up resulting in halfway player elimination as the second player becomes this second fiddle casting their little vote about like maybe we should do that and maybe we should do that while the other player controls the main state. And again, this might come down to your group and the way you interact with the game. For us, that's been the dynamic that's happened with the merge mechanic as far as having a primary dominant player and then a second fiddle player who feels a little less invested in the game. So that's worth noting. Again, overall merge mechanic I like, having a second fiddle player that feels halfway eliminated from the game, that is not quite as good. As far as meaningful critiques and things that take away from my experience of Ankh, things that make it a little less awesome than I would otherwise want it to be. There's really going to be two things there, and both of them come down to me wanting more powers and abilities, more craziness and, and whatever in this game. And the first is going to be that tech tree over here. Every player has their own individual player power for their god, but then they also have their Ankh power tech tree that is very stagnant. There's only 12 powers total, there's 4 in one, 4 in the other, 4 in the next, and every game you can have the potential to get 2 within each tree. So the variable ways you can combine those powers, while there are different options you can choose and different pathways you can try to push down, they are limited. There's not a ton of variability. Now, I appreciate why you wouldn't want to have every single player having their own set of powers. I understand that. It would be crazy. You have to learn every single thing going on. Every time you play with a new god, there'd be a ton of new things to learn. I understand that. But I kind of wish there were more. I don't have a specific answer what they were. Maybe if you had six in every tree. Maybe if you had another tree. I don't know. But while I like the fact that they give you pathways forward and strategies to pursue, I wish there was more expandability around those options, more on powers to bring to the table, because right now, at a certain point, you'll start playing the games, and the pre-scripted paths are fairly locked in. And then secondly, along the same lines, is I wish the Guardians were more present in the game. Right now you have three Guardians in the game. Three Guardians. That's not a ton of monsters. That's not a ton of variability. And not all players can get their hands on them either. And so you don't have a ton of monsters in the game, especially contrasted with a game like Blood Rage or Rising Sun. There is less monster madness, less monster chaos in any single game. The variability game to game is huge because of the fact that you see fewer monsters. Those Guardians, it could take you dozens of games before, you, forget dozens, it could take you hundreds of games before you see the combinations of gods, of the Guardians, of every single thing going on in the game. Plus the scenarios, of course. So very Variability is a huge plus, but in terms of any individual game seeing a certain level of craziness, it's not to the level I'd want. Now obviously you can house rule around that fairly easily by just adding in more guardians, more choices. You could easily house rule that. But then that moves to the house rule category and we're not reviewing this game based on house rules, we're reviewing this game based on the way it is. Also I haven't actually tried any of those house rules so I wouldn't comment on them. But yeah, that's something you can easily fix in terms of having more guardians in the game. But I, I, I want Ankh to be... Ankh right now is a bit more numbers game. Let's move to final thoughts and score. Final thoughts and score. Ankh is amazing. My very first play, I sat there and said, this has the potential to rival Blood Rage. But I've said that before about other area control games, and I find that usually the freshness and newness often has me thinking that it rivals Blood Rage. Blood Rage, for context, is my favorite area control game of all time, so that's my standard. That's my standard to beat. I've said it before, I've said it about Lords of Hellas, I've said it well now about Ankh, where I'm like, I get a first game and I'm like, this is so amazing. 
and I get subsequent games on it, and, and my feelings cool a bit. The newness is gone, and now I'm now I'm measuring up other games against Blood Rage that I've played multiple times. The newness is gone, the excitement's gone, and I'm still diving in and playing them. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot to see, there's a lot to experience, and I really, really enjoy Ankh. But it does not beat Blood Rage, at least for me. The tech trees, the lack of tech trees, the guardians, those take away from my experience. The slightly number crunchiness of it compared to the pure huge power madness that you attack each other. Those things all slightly take away from the experience it could be. I really enjoy Ankh. It is a solid game. It is one that I easily recommend. It is one that I'm having a ton of fun with and the variability is off the chart. And I cannot wait to dive into the expansions to see what the expansion potentially brings it up a notch. Because it may well bring it up a notch. It's something that I want to dive into but I want to get this review out first. Because at some point... There will be a play this, not that. Uh, There's a video I do on the channel where I compare two games. There will be a play this, not that against Blood Rage, but that will only be after I've had more plays of Ankh under my belt, more attempts to see the Guardians, more gods, and of course the expansion to see where that goes. As far as rating, I'm putting Ankh at a 4.5. It is this close to a 5. It is a solid game, it is an enjoyable game, but it does feel a little bit more samey from game to game, contrasted with other area control games where I feel every single game is a new way of trying to mix up those powers, a new way to see what goes on. Ankh is immensely entertaining, immensely fun, but for right now, it is still a 4.5 out of 5 on my scale. As far as other recommendations, if you like Ankh, if you like Ankh, or if you like, well, if you like Tigers and Euphrates, let's go with Tigers and Euphrates first. Tigers and Euphrates is another area controlish game that's very number crunchy by Reina Knizia. It is a fantastic game that Ankh is very reminiscent of in the way it feels. Tigers is an excellent game. If you like Tigers, I recommend checking out Ankh. And if you like Ankh, I highly recommend checking out Tigers and Euphrates. And then Kemet, which I've talked about in this review. If you like the Egyptian theme and if you want more powers and abilities in an area control game, more chaos, more madness, then I highly recommend checking out Kemet Blood and Sand by Madigo Games. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, have a good one.